Good morning. I'm so happy that everyone could join us here virtually this morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Thrall, and I'm the General and Personnel Manager for the Lexington Philharmonic. Uh, every Friday in April, we will be here at 10 a.m. sharing new videos and hosting conversations with our musicians and community members about how the world intersects with music. Today's Connect Coffee Hour is hosted by Lexville Interim Artistic Advisor, Kelly Corcoran. Kelly joined Lexville in this position in January, and we are thrilled to have her on board at Lexville. She is also the Artistic Director and Conductor of Intersection, a contemporary ensemble in Nashville, Tennessee. Previously, she served nine seasons as Associate Conductor at Nashville Symphony and Director of the Nashville Symphony Chorus. Kelly is also pursuing her master's in public health in health behavior from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, today, our guests on this coffee hour are Christine Smith, who is the executive director of Seedly here in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, Christine is trained academically as a geographer and her gardening experience is rooted in her subtropics, um, in the subtropics of Florida where she grew up as well as her grandmother's garden. Uh, we also have Jerry Catherine Howell um, as our guest today, who is the program director at Josephine Sculpture Park in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, in addition to her role at Josephine Sculpture Park, she is also an Americana singer-songwriter, rhythm guitarist, and teaching artist. Um, so lastly, just a couple of housekeeping uh, notes for this morning. For everyone watching, uh, we'd love to hear from you this morning. There will be times in the conversation um, where you can share your experiences or thoughts or ask questions. Uh, there will be a poll on Zoom for our attendees here. And for those watching on Facebook, we hope you will participate in the comments because we'll also be watching and engaging with you there. Uh, you can also enable closed captions at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there should be an icon that says live transcriptions there. Uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Kelly. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with all of you. And uh, maybe you've come to some of our other coffee hours. Maybe this is the first one, but these are opportunities for us to connect with each other, to highlight community members and the work of the Lexington Philharmonic, and to engage in some community conversations around topics of relevance and value to our community. So we hope to engage in a casual but meaningful conversation this morning um, that will leave you with some information, some things to think about, and to uh, allow space for us to hear each other. So as Sarah mentioned, I do want to encourage you along the way, if you have any comments or any questions for our guests this morning, you can put them in the Q&A or the chat function or on Facebook. Um, we'll be responding to all of that. So we look forward to hearing from you. Today, we are talking about music and nature, and we will explore the ways in which music intersects with nature. This conversation could go in many different directions. Musical instruments have long been connected to the natural world with ancient flutes made from animal bones, drums made from animal skins, and the diverse woods being used for wind instruments, string instruments, and even more. Um, and nature, of course, is filled with song as we listen to bird songs and whale songs that include rhythms, pitches, and patterns similar to what we may see in composition. The natural world has served as a source of inspiration for many musical works and for composers to find their inner creative voice. So today we're going to talk about how classical music has been inspired by the natural world and we'll hear about some beautiful natural spaces in our community. And we're also going to share some details on some upcoming collaborations that we have planned with Lexington Philharmonic. So we're joined by Jerry and Christine. Thank you both for being here this morning. And I'd like to start by sharing the missions of both Josephine Sculpture Park and Seed Leaf. So I'll start with Josephine Sculpture Park, which is in Frankfort, Kentucky. And their mission is to connect people to each other and the land through the arts. Josephine Sculpture Park provides creative arts and nature education to our community and transformative opportunities to artists while conserving the beauty of Kentucky's native rural landscape. 
And we're going to share links where you can, you know, visit the websites of um, all of these organizations too and, and learn more about them. Seed Leaf is a community gardening organization that provides horticultural training and supports the practice of gardening and small scale farming in urban space. So before we dive in, we want to start with a question to you to see what you think about this topic. And the question is, does connecting with the natural world help you to feel more creative and inspired? And we'd love to hear from you and see what you think about that. Um, in the meantime, let's dive into some questions while we're waiting for our audience to give us some feedback. And Jerry, I'd love to start with you. Um, Josephine is committed to the role the arts play as a connection to the land and to each other. So starting there as program director, tell us about the power of experiencing art within the natural world and in natural outdoor spaces. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, I, I just want to invite you to imagine yourself in a gallery, you know, an indoor gallery with sculpture and painting, and then remove the walls. And how, how does that, that change what you're picturing in your head? You know, to me, it just lights up my imagination and brings in so many other elements to play with. Light, sound, um, you know, feeling, feeling the wind on your skin and experiencing art in natural spaces. I think, and we feel at Josephine Sculpture Park just really sparks this imagination and joy. And we're also very, we take very seriously that we feel art in this outdoor space makes it more accessible to folks in that you can run around, you can explore, stay as long as you like, um, explore nature, go where you feel pulled in nature or go to a different sculpture. And it's really, really fun for all ages. So that's, that's one of the, the powers of art in a natural space. But then also as a program director, I think a lot about the impact of connecting with art and nature and the impact that has on our well-being. It, there's tons of research out there that supports when you connect with nature, it has positive impacts on your well-being. And it's the same for the arts. When you experience the arts, when you create art, and to me, combining those just amplifies those, those health benefits. Um, and it's fun. It's, it's fun. <laughs> and and, and last, lastly, you know, we often view art as human culture, as something that is separate but when you when you put art in nature in natural spaces i think it breaks down that dichotomy to really help you experience the interdependence that we are nature art is nature nature is art and and to me that's that's very powerful that's why i love what i do at josephine sculpture park that's great and even on chilly mornings like today, it's cold. Yes. In fact, be cold in Nashville. Yeah. So Christine, let's let's hear from you. Seedleaf works in urban spaces. And like our work as artists, um, you're working to build community. And so I'd love to hear why is it important that we cultivate gardens in urban environments and tell us how gardening can help to build community. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of research that has been published and that continues to come out that shows that human beings have like just a link to the natural world. And there's something about being out amongst the color green or being with trees and plants that just helps to restore a sense of inner peace, modern world, just through work and, you know, or deals with family, really sort of, um, uh, and does, right? Like a lot of people rushing around, a lot of people looking at screens, it's not naturally how human beings are supposed to function. We're social creatures and we're social creatures that are really intimately tied to uh, the outdoors. 
And so when we think about garden spaces or green spaces even in cities, really we're thinking about a larger issue of health and well-being. Um, and from that, I think when we are feeling okay, when we're feeling emotionally uh, stable, when we're feeling physically well, then we have the room and the time to engage with our neighbors, to engage civically, right? So gardens on its on its surface might seem a bit silly, right? Looking at a pansy might seem a very, very silly thing or a viola. But when you realize that it's doing this deeper work, right? It's, it's really quite amazing to think about. Um, and when you witness people coming together in a garden or even gardening, an amazing thing happens in that the person who is growing zucchini by July, you have a glut of zucchini and you don't want to look at it or eat anymore. So what do you do? You find the nearest person to share it with, right? And this becomes an example of how people start to build community. You don't want to waste food, but you have a neighbor who you think might appreciate this. And that leads us to having these conversations with people who we otherwise probably don't communicate with. Like I dare say there's a lot of folks who live next to people who they've never conversed with, who they've never eaten a meal with, who, you know, they don't know their children, but they live right next door. And so in an urban space where we're all sort of densely packed in, gardening spaces help with this health question, but it also helps build this kind of community resiliency where, you know, when you know your neighbor and when you talk to them, there is like this joy of uh, mutual knowledge of each other, but also in times of emergency, you now have someone that you can go to to ask for assistance. Um, and I just love, you know, uh, Jerry's response to thinking about the intertwinedness of nature and art, um, because I think that's part of it too. Like the human mind wants to be creatively challenged and push forward and to see something unique and different. Um, and I think with the internet, we're all sort of glued to screens and we're all seeing the same things over and over and over again. But I think there's something so wonderful about nature that has the ability to surprise us like Jerry said, that bit of breeze that you can feel on your skin, right? That you just weren't expecting or to see birds engaged in some silly fight or, you know, tittering, right? Um, there's something about that that's quite magical that can happen in a natural space like a garden or a sculpture park that's outdoors. I love that. And I love the awakening of all of our senses as we engage with art and all of these things. Um, so Jerry, at, at Josephine Sculpture Park, it's important for the artwork and the land to fully coexist aesthetically and naturally. Um, so this makes me think sometimes about music where composers sometimes are aiming or seemingly aiming to kind of conquer nature, you know, in their composition. Um, while other composers, and, it, and I think about the Japanese composer Toru Takamitsu, they aim to create music that in many ways is one with nature. So I'd love for you to talk about what this means to you when art and the land are coexisting together. So um, this, this question immediately makes me think of our land management responsibilities at the park because that is often something that we don't get to talk about that people don't necessarily think about but is so integral to integrating the arts and the whole philosophy behind the sculpture park and so what I mean by that is we let the land grow what's there you know we let the seeds grow up we don't have manicured landscaping um we really we just want to see what's there and so 10 a little over 10 years ago the land was um heavily farmed tobacco soybean farm and now it's 10 plus years through succession and we have eastern red cedars and we have butterfly milkweed and we have goldenrod and we also have a lot of invasive plant species that come up that we have to deal with as well like cowrie pear, um, autumn olive, honeysuckle and we approach this, this these changes I, I feel like often in a very artistic way the same way that you would approach building a sculpture or writing a song that you know, you're experimenting and you're responding and you're failing and you're succeeding. And um, 
when we work with artists to place their work in the park, Melanie Van Houten, our director, really takes on um, a, a major role in that because she has such an intimate knowledge of the land having grown up there. And we think about, you know, what, okay, what species is going to be blooming at what time and would that fit well with this sculpture? Or is the flower going to bloom inside the sculpture? Um, and 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 it's it's really fun and meaningful to us to be able to know the land in this way and to think in this way. And I, I think that um, in my experience talking to gardeners and gardening myself and farmers, it's often similar. You're you're approaching something um, not always knowing what the result is going to be and you're responding and it's a creative process like Christine mentioned. Um, so, so yeah, and often when we have artists that come and live and build at the, at the sculpture park, they're responding to the site. They're responding to, um, to the plants, to the sounds, to the wind, and they're site-specific sculptures. So that's, that's another way, another element of how art and nature coexist is through the artists that create there as well. That's great. I have a question for Jerry, if you don't mind me interrupting sure, Kelly. Ahead, yeah. So I was talking to a gardener the other day and we were talking about how our diets have changed. Like, you know, before we intensively gardened, we might be totally fine with eating strawberries in December, but now we just think it's absolutely disgusting. Even <laughs> if the strawberry is fine, we don't want it because we've just gotten so used now to eating with whatever was popping up in the garden. And I wonder if it's the same for your artists now that they're thinking about what is blooming during this time that my sculpture or whatever I create will be in this natural space. Do you have artists who are saying, well, let me sort of change my technique or way of doing something to accommodate being in this, to accommodate this new kind of space where my art will be? I think that that does happen. I think sometimes it, I think sometimes the artist articulates that and they're very intentional about that. And then sometimes I've, just perceived it happening where um, maybe it wasn't as conscious of a decision, but but that the environment is influencing how their how their work takes shape in that place. Um, I I would be curious to follow up with some of the artists that have been artists and residents at the park to see if those changes have stayed with them as they've built in other parks. That would be a really really interesting question. So thank you for asking that question, Christine. And, and I'm, I'm coming back to the composer Takamitsu and this concept of gardening and creativity and all these things that we're circling around um, because he has a beautiful quote that says, my music is like a garden and I am the gardener. So that's him as a composer articulating a lot of these concepts that we're describing. So can you tell us more about like the, the creative practice of gardening and how creativity plays into gardening? Oh, and you're muted, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so immediately what comes to mind is failure. Like, I think there's a sense that the gardener or anyone who goes, a human that goes into nature will exercise ultimate control and ultimate victory over what you are trying to design or create. And that's simply not true. Um, and I just feel like perhaps I, gardeners um, and owners or sculpture parks are co-creators with nature, right? And they have the ultimate say on how things will end up and look. And so, you know, for example, as I was, before we started, I was telling Sarah uh, Thrall that at one of our gardens, our North Pole Community Garden on North Limestone, Right now, it is getting ready to undergo some major earthwork. We have an invasive species of grass called Bermuda grass. It's native to Africa that has come here. It's been here for a very long time, but it sends out these runners. So it has this intensity that it puts out. It's all of that to say, it's incredibly hard to get rid of, and it makes it incredibly hard to grow things. Um, it goes through our raised beds. It covers uh, areas that we cultivated on the ground, and so we're about to do one last stand where we try to defeat the Bermuda grass, but 
for as long as we've been there, it has sort of steered our efforts. It has sometimes destroyed our efforts. And so the creativity comes through, okay, how can we not try to conquer this this year, but how can we work with it to be as productive as possible? How can we work with it to create a space that is as welcoming and, and inviting as possible, right? It's not ideal always, but in this situation, how can we think in our, on our feet and potentially get something that works and that accommodates the situation and that even looks good. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, there are people I meet who say that they have a black thumb or a brown thumb, which is ridiculous because all gardeners, all gardeners kill things in large amounts, right? Um, it's just a matter of paying attention and having this sort of sense of, uh, collaboration with the natural world and not one in which your vision is like the the top or the thing that will uh that you will ultimately achieve it's being flexible um and so it's fun it, you don't really know what you'll end up with i think similar to jerry's thoughts it's kind of just yeah it's exciting and exhilarating to know that you can start something and end up somewhere totally new and not know that you were ever going to end up there and have something to eat at the end of it, which is like the cherry on top. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Um, and later on in our conversation, we're going to talk about how we're all working together, Lex Phil, with both of your spaces. So that's like just planting a nugget of of excitement for our audience that's listening today because we're going to dive into that. Um, but another thing, of course, that we're exploring today is how different composers have been inspired by the natural world. And so we have curated a playlist of some of our favorite pieces that are inspired by nature. And it includes things from Beethoven Pastoral Symphony to William Grant Stills, Wood Notes, and we'll share that playlist out to everybody at the end of our talk. Of course, it is not an exhaustive list as there are you know, so many pieces of music inspired by nature. Um, but now we're gonna listen to a performance by our Let's Fill harpist, Elaine Cook of WC's Claire de Lune um, or Moonlight. And this is an arrangement for harp that Elaine put together. The work is originally for piano and it's inspired by a poem which begins, your soul is a chosen landscape and speaks of how the sad and beautiful light of the moon sets the birds in the trees dreaming. So just beautiful imagery there. And we're gonna um, sit back and enjoy a performance of Claire de Lune by Elaine. Thank you. 
just love Claire de Lune. I think it's such a beautiful piece. And I'd love to, um, in Bravo Dewey Lane, I'd, I'd love to invite our audience, if you have any favorite pieces of music inspired by nature, feel free to put them in the chat um, and share them with us because we would love to hear what your favorite pieces are. Um, Jerry, you're a musician yourself, an artist, and I'd love to hear from you. Why do you think so many artists are drawn to the natural world um, and express the natural world in their art? So I, you know, Christine mentioned earlier on that humans are drawn to connecting with other life forms, and you can call that whatever you want. I've heard it called the biophilia hypothesis. Um, but in my personal experience and also in conversations with other artists, I, I am very drawn to the, the mental slowdown that connecting with nature allows my, my brain and my heart to experience. And in that quietness, I am able to perceive this invisible connection with non-human species. And I think that that's where art can help us communicate those in-betweens, those invisible pieces of our lives and and make it more accessible to people and it's in those moments connecting with nature that lyrics come to me that images come to me poems come to me and um you know that's that's my personal experience yeah i love that and sarah i'm curious if if the poll closed what our audience thought about whether or not connecting with the natural world helped them to feel more creative and inspired. So 100% <laughs> said, uh, kind of shared that feeling, right? Of, and I love that slowing down as an opportunity to connect with that, that creative side of ourself. Um, Christine, we're gonna turn to bird songs and some other things in a moment, but I read in your bio that you're really proud of the title Ambassador of Flowers. So I just really wanted to hear more about that. Oh, you're muted again, Christine, sorry. <laughs> you would think I would know by now to unmute before talking, I always forget. Um, but before I worked for Seedleaf, I volunteered for Seedleaf and Ryan Cook was the first director of Seedleaf. And, you know, I, I, I kept sort of harping about how Seedleaf gardens needed more flowers. It was all food, but it, you know, I, there was no pretty flowers. Um, and so at a certain point he was like, okay, plant whatever you want, you could be the ambassador of flowers. And he was joking, but I took it very seriously, um, simply because I'm a person who deals with uh, anxiety and depression regularly. And, and I know many gardeners who do. And one of the things that I think all of us have in common is just seeing a beautiful array of flowers helps to bring us out of rough spots. And I know for some people it's even saved lives. And so I feel really passionate that every garden should have food, but also something beautiful in it uh, for the eyes and soul. And so that's why I'm very happy to be an ambassador of flowers. Everyone should have flowers growing somewhere. Yay. <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you for sharing that. Let's listen to some examples of sounds from our natural world and talk about the music, musical possibilities of each. So we're going to start with some bird songs, um, because many composers have mimicked the sound of birds in their orchestral compositions. And so let's listen to a little bit of a Kentucky warbler bird song. So Jerry, um, how do you see the songs of the natural world relating to music? Like, is that music? And I know, whoa, we could have a huge conversation about like, where is the line between music and quote unquote noise and all of that. And certainly composers sample different sounds, but to you, what we just heard, is that music? I mean, I feel like, who am I to say it's not? I'm, you know, I'm not a a bird <laughs> so, but, but it does make me think about you know bird songs exist to communicate something often to define territory or attract mates or whatever and I think if I'm not mistaken birds learn songs a little later in life and that I think they can in interpret them slightly but they're you know it's 
a little individual to the bird. And it just makes me think of fiddle tunes, like passing down fiddle tunes um, and how you keep the same structure, the same notes, but you put a little bit of your own style, you learn a little bit at, at a certain age and it, it's all communication to me. And it, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, let's listen to another one and then I'm gonna come to you, Christine. So now we're gonna listen to, um, you know, composers, they don't only try to mimic the sounds of nature, but sometimes they will literally record sounds from nature and put it into a composition. So one example of that is a work by the American composer, Alan Havanis, and God created great whales and it integrates the recorded whale songs with the orchestra. And so we're going to listen to a little bit of that while you're, where, you're, where you will hear the whale song. So we would love to hear from you as audience members, you know, what do you think? Do you consider bird songs to be music? And what did you think of Havanis using those whale songs in his orchestral work? Um, and of course, you know, nature isn't always full of beauty. There is great power and destruction at times and um, a, a kind of wildness that is unpredictable. And often composers may integrate this into their writing as well. For example, there's a composer, Chaya Chernowin, who composed a set of winter songs where you can hear the ice cracking and you can hear the frigid temperature. Um, and we would encourage you to listen to that as well. It's part of our nature playlist if you wanna listen to that. Um, so Christine, Let's hear from you about the wildness of nature and the unpredictability of nature and how that impacts your work and how that really does demonstrate like the resilience and survival that we see in nature. Yeah, um, so immediately two things came to mind. For us in urban environments, the nature that we often encounter are cats who come and wander into our gardens and scratch out uh, parts of our raised bed and also hawks. So at a few of our sites, we've had chickens. At one time we had chickens at London Farrell and at another time we had chicken, we have chickens currently at our uh, farm space, our Seedleaf Community Farm. And the girls, they know when a hawk is watching them and they sort of scurry inside at, into their little coops to hide. Um, and so even though you would think within sort of the urban core of Lexington, there's this question of whether that the spaces that we have, is that real nature compared to say something like the Gorge or Raven's Run? I would say yes, and, and it is quite unpredictable, but not quite in the ways that I think most people would imagine who are used to hearing about, um, I don't know, encounters with bears or sharks or something like that, right? Um, and so that's a little bit of the unpredictability and also just weather patterns for us. Um, you know, right now we're all freezing. Uh, last night was a deep frost and again, we're gonna have another one. And so for us, there's always, and especially with climate change, it just seems that every year it's a little bit more unpredictable about what we will get in the springtime. Um, and for us, it's not such a big deal where we can easily sort of bounce back. The things that we're growing uh, aren't severely, usually aren't severely impacted by the weather or we can easily replace it. But for larger growers like Reeds Valley Orchard last year, the late frosts, basically meant they couldn't have apples for the season. Um, and so the unpredictability of nature for farmers is, is serious. It's not as dramatic, but it is very serious and costly. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you for sharing that. We're we're going to turn to another performance just to add another musical <laughs> element to our our talk this morning. This is another performance from Elaine Cook, our Lexville harpist, and she is performing Gail Barber's Harp of the Western Wind. And uh, again, I contemplate what you all both have said about the wind and all of these things moving across the land as we listen to this work. beautiful music. Um, so, you know, as we get towards the end of our conversation this morning, kind of the final final uh, run of questions here, um, we really are excited at Lexington Philharmonic to be partnering with both of you, um, Seedleaf and Josephine Sculpture Park on some future collaborations and projects. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but um, Christine, I want to hear more about the name of your organization, Seedleaf. And, you know, because I was reading about the seed leaf, right, as a vital <laughs> um, mechanism in providing energy for a plant. And so it got me thinking, like, can we all be seed leaves for our own community? And so just tell me about the name and what that means to you. Yeah. And so in certain types of germination, uh, inside of a seed is basically all it needs to survive and to thrive until it emerges from the ground. So often within, in, in some seeds, there are kind of embryonic leaves that are just sort of tucked in there. And when a seed starts to germinate, when it's gotten information that weakens its outer shell, it'll put out a root. And then uh, once that root is anchored, it'll start to shoot up uh, a, a, either a sh leaf or two leaves that then act as almost like solar panels, right? That gets energy for the seed. Uh, until it's true leaves, the leaves that you'll see when you go and buy a plant emerges. Uh, so seed leaves are basically the very beginning that helps uh, or is the precursor to something bigger and greater, hopefully fruit or something that you could cook or eat or something that's just beautiful to look at. And so the idea is that we are just sort of the the start to something that could grow beyond us. Like the seed leaves will fall off. They turn yellow and disappear after the plant starts to mature. So the idea is, is that, you know, as a nonprofit, we don't believe in just being around forever. Um, that's not our particular mission. The idea is, is that we can help to create these garden spaces and help to uh, create these community bonds that lead to a day when everyone and everywhere has a load of community gardens that are attended to by neighbors. Uh, you know, seed leaf should, we shouldn't be around 50 years from now. We should have a city of gardens and gardeners if we've done our job well we should just rot away almost <laughs> and fall off and leave it to our community to take on this work. All these beautiful images and, and correlations between you know, the work that, that you all do and how we can grow in our community. Um, Jerry, tell us about your artist in residence program because I know um, we may be weaving some aspects of that into some of our future partnerships. Sure, so uh, our artist in residence program is an annual residency for artists to live and to create work at Josephine Sculpture Park. And it's funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. 
and we host emerging through mid-career professional artists from a variety of disciplines, so not just sculpture. Um, and artists are often creating something that they've never done before. They're trying something new, and, and we really like to support that. And this year, we hope to host six artists in residence from May to October. And we invite everybody to come visit. You can often see them working in real time on their pieces. And sometimes artists want to do public workshops. Um, and sometimes they want to collaborate with specific organizations in the region. And we hope that that that, that works out this year with Lexville. Yeah, we're excited too. Um, so yeah, we are very excited that we um, plan in the summer and in the fall to be working collaboratively with Seedleaf and Josephine Sculpture Park to bring Lexington Philharmonic musicians to all of these spaces. And um, the details are to TBA. <laughs> They'll be coming and announced very soon. And we also plan on having some musicians do pop-up performances at the farmer's market as well. So um, our audiences can be looking to the future for those performances coming down the pipeline as the weather warms up. Um, so I'd love to ask both of you this question you know, why are you excited to bring Lexville musicians to your spaces? And, you know, just maybe frame that also in regards to the power of partnership and collaboration and, and how all that can, can help support the work that we're all doing. It doesn't matter. Christine, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're excited. I think I'm always trying, or my hope is that people see garden spaces as more than a place to either get something out of or a place to do work in, but as sites of leisure. And that could be kind of engaging and entertaining um, and stimulating in ways. And I think this is just one way of showing that, that the garden space could be a place where you come with your family and just to sit on a blanket and perhaps hear music, whether it's from a bird or from the Lexington Philharmonic. Um, and so, yeah, it's just my hope that more and more people see our gardens as places to be in. Jerry? So uh, we, you know, speaking to the power of collaborations, we, we always feel like partnering results in something more creative, stronger, more unique than we could have come up with ourselves. And that is certainly the case in, in what's to come in partnership with Lexville. You know, we've never, what we're dreaming up, we've never hosted at the Sculpture Park. It'd be a truly unique experience for us and for, for visitors who have been to us before, or who've never been to us before. Um, and we've never featured classical music before either, which is, will, which will be incredible. Um, and, you know, speaking to, we've talked about ecology and connections and resilience. And I really think that the, the resilience of our communities lies in the strength and the diversity of our connections. And I think conversations like this and partnerships like this um, really speak to that. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Christine, there's a quote on your website by M Michael Pollan, which I want to read. It says, the single greatest lesson the garden teaches is that as long as the sun still shines and people still can plan and plant, think and do, we can, if we bother to try, find ways to provide for ourselves without diminishing the world. And I love that sentiment of human resilience and our capacity to contribute positively but without having to negatively impact our communities. You know, this idea that we don't have to diminish the world through this work that we do. Um, so this is kind of the final question <laughs> to both of you. Just, you know, if you have any final thoughts on um, the musical soundscape of nature and, you know, its role in our lives, you know, to provide this capacity, um, but without that kind of diminishing of the world as well. Maybe Christine, I'll start with you again. <laughs> Yeah, I think what we can do to sort of, you know, in, you know, mentioning this quote, when we enter a garden space or when we enter a park, it sort of reminds us that there is so much beauty out there and that, that we're part of it, that we're not just these isolated humans that can go into these environments and then go back home and, you know, leave those environments behind. Like we're really like a, we're all supporting each other. And, um, 
being influenced by these different elements, whether it's plant life, whether it's trees, whether it's bird uh, songs and whatnot. And so I think really, I hope when people leave a garden, when people leave this talk, actually, that they'll see that they are part of something larger, uh, that they are in interconnected, that the arts that we love, right, uh, we can support in multiple ways by attending a performance in a garden or an art park, or uh, that we can become stewards of our environment when we go to natural space, like when we go home, now that we've seen what it could look like when we encourage diverse ecosystems, we could try to find ways of supporting uh, bird life and insect life and pollinators in our own backyard. So the hope is that people see that we are really, really connected. Um, and instead of thinking of ourselves as isolated actors, we can think of ourselves of, as intertwined in a way and that that intertwinedness leads to more resiliency. The diversity of connection that uh, Jerry mentioned is a beautiful thing, um, but it does take some thought. It does take being open to listening and to seeing and to opening up those senses, um, which I hope that you know people experience that when they do enter nature. So it's a bit of work, but I think well worth it. Yeah, I love that. Sherry, what do you think? I underscore everything that Christine just said and just really invite you to listen. Just to just be open and let it let yourself feel how it how it transforms you you know and that is that interconnection well I want to thank you both you know for being here and taking the time to share the work of your organizations and your commitment to to community and everything that you do in artistry and creativity um we really are excited and I think you know we always want to be in natural spaces, but certainly right now during COVID, this has created an increased opportunity to do that and to really be able to partner with all of you and be in your space and be in our community. So we're really excited about that. Um, we have a lot of resources that we want to share with our audience. And before we wrap up, I do want to invite our audience, if they have any final comments or questions, now would be a great time to share that with us. We hope that you've enjoyed the talk. Um, so we do have a nature playlist we put together. And like I said, it is not exhaustive. It's just, you know, a, a, rep, a small representative list of some great pieces that you can listen to that are inspired by nature. Um, additionally, there are multiple links. Um, well, first, let me say Jerry is a musician. And so we have a link to her website if you want to listen to Jerry's <laughs> music. We definitely want to give a plug to you, Jerry. And your Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I think we've already shared the links to both Seed Leaf and Josephine Sculpture Park. Um, but then there's a number of other links we just wanted to share with you all that are some uh, articles from Science Magazine and other sources that talk about the relationship between nature and music. And there's just some really interesting things to, to think about there. And there's also a book um, that we'll share the link to you that includes essays from many composers talking about nature and how that has interacted with their compositional process and things like that. Um, so of course, this conversation could go, you know, there's so much to talk about. And I just think the natural world is so beautiful. And um, I can't wait to, to be in both of your spaces. Um, just final question, jo Jerry, how many acres is Josephine Sculpture Park? It's big. We're 30, 30 acres. Yeah. And then Christine, how many gardens do you have? How many garden spaces? Oh, hang on. 12. <laughs> 12. <laughs> well, okay. yeah. so lots of beautiful land to explore and get to know and um, invest in. So I want to thank you both for being here today. And I'm going to pass it off to Sarah. Thank you all. I was just sitting back here listening and loving all of this conversation. Thank you again to Christine and Jerry and Kelly for being here today. Um, also, a uh, Big bravo to Elaine Cook for her beautiful performances of Claire de Lune and Harp of the Western Wing, Wind. Um, both of those performances by Elaine will be on our website and our YouTube, so people can go and watch those again and again. <laughs> um, I wanna thank everyone on Facebook and Zoom for tuning in, and we will return next week, next Friday at 10 a.m. for a conversation with Kelly and members of the Lexville Percussion and Harp sections. Uh, we also want to take a moment here to thank all our amazing supporters and members who make our work possible. 
Um, if you are in a position to support us, please consider becoming a member of Lexville today. For as little as $5 a month, um, you can do that on our website at lexville.org. Um, lastly, I'm sharing a link uh, in the chat to a brief survey um, for our community. It just takes like two and a half minutes. Um, your feedback is important to us as we move forward and develop new programs and concerts. So we'd love to hear uh, your feedback. Um, I think that's it. Thank you again, all of you for being here this morning. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and see you next week.